five, four. Always give your best. Never get discouraged. Never be petty. Always remember. Let's talk about getting spending and inflation under control and cutting your tax rates. There is no justification whatsoever for this outrageous and brutal act Let of us all take more responsibility, not only for ourselves and our families, but for our communities and our country. Hello, my name is Rakia Smith. I'm a sales executive at WNBC TV in New York, the largest television market in the country. Had it not been for the efforts of the Office of Communication, Inc., of the United Church of Christ, also known as OC, Inc., I would not be where I am today. But more about me later. You may be asking, what is OC, Inc., and how does it relate to the United Church of Christ? To understand this unique relationship, we need to step back to an earlier time when the nation was torn apart over the struggle for civil rights. 1963 was a very traumatic year in Jackson. Uh, it was a part of several traumatic years because this was the time that the system was being most challenged. There was no coverage of the African American community except crime, the African-American community simply didn't exist. Ownership of media um, is a civil rights issue, and programming uh, is a civil rights issue, because uh, minorities were not around when those licenses were first given out, those broadcast licenses. There was such a, such a terrible situation in Jackson, Mississippi, with WLBT. Black people were never never addressed by their first names and, and titles. They were not allowed to, to get on the air and, and talk about the civil rights movement which was going on then and, and the, the civil rights laws which were up before Congress. I would give, could give an instance when sorry cable trouble signs would be put on and Thurgood Marshall or Martin Luther King might have been on national news and you could recognize that's Martin Luther King, suddenly there would be cable trouble. The Citizens Council at one point had congratulated this station for deleting national civil rights news. It had a, a KKK bookstore on the property and it uh, discriminated terribly against blacks. It was the NBC outlet. It's the most powerful station in the Mid-South. Somebody really had to do something about this and, and we had the capacity to do it and the necessary techniques which nobody else had. Taking on a television station's license was something no one had ever done. The risks were high. To spare the United Church of Christ expensive legal battles, Dr. Everett C. Parker, the church's executive director of the Office of Communication, created OC Inc. as a separate not-for-profit entity. Its purpose, to defend the airwaves as a public trust and to ensure that all segments of society had access to media outlets. From the beginning, OC Inc. found itself embroiled in controversial issues of social and racial justice. I think that uh, churches being strong moral leaders have a role to play here and certainly uh, Everett Parker and his colleagues played that and you have to commend the courage of the church people who did this in Jackson, Mississippi. They were subject to some danger and they really acted very bravely. Here were a bunch of largely northerners coming in saying that the local television station was going to have to serve everybody. The Office of Communication was up against one of the biggest, most prestigious uh, communication law firm in, in the country. I had been to, to many, many communications lawyers asking for help and they all told me why we couldn't do this. So Orrin Judd and I decided that if we, if we were going to monitor it had to be by white people. So the Hendersons recruited all the people. I trained them in monitoring. I never learned the names of any of them. I don't know a single one of them. Gordon Henderson was chairman of the Department of Political Science at Millsaps College. Gordon asked my husband and I if we would be interested in 
loaning out the use of our house, which was in North Jackson suburbs. We had people who would come to the house at five o'clock in the morning. Um, they would stay, you know, several hours, and then other people would come. So there were people going and coming all day. Everett had done an enormous job working with people in Mississippi, and all of the, um, for example, his gathering of the log for a solid week of what was being broadcast there and what was not being broadcast. I was mightily impressed with what came out of that, uh, that study. We decided we would not uh, follow FCC rules uh, for bringing something before them because it, it would be impossible because all of the federal regulatory agencies kept the public out of their business. The FCC would not grant standing and what we did was using the monitoring study, using our observation of the station, we filed what you would file if you went into a federal district court because of course the commission sits in the position of a district court uh, because you can appeal the commission's decisions to the Court of Appeals. Lamar Life was very confident they were going to win that. Of course they did. Uh, they had very good lawyers that they brought in here and uh, they maintained that they weren't discriminating against anybody and that they were doing a great job of operating this television station. WLBT tries to stay in touch with all aspects of our community life. We sh shape our program policy around this kind of information gathering and interpretation. Disappointed but not defeated, they took their evidence to the United States Court of Appeal. In 1965, in a decision by Warren Berger, um, held that uh, the public does have standing and went on to say that um, a newspaper can be operated at the whim of its publisher, but a broadcast station cannot. He's a public fiduciary, he's obligated to serve the public interest, and he's accountable to the public in his area. After several years of intense arguments, Justice Berger made his decision. It was one that would forever change the broadcast industry and solidify the role of the United Church of Christ as a leader in the struggle to defend the public interest in broadcasting. The last decision by Warren Berger before he went up to the Supreme Court uh, in 1969 was to reverse the commission again to say this record is beyond repair you've got to set up an interim operation and you've got to stop the operation of WLBT. When they realized that you could take the license away from a TV station when you realized that that great economic power could be lost because of the way you're treating black people, then it really had an impact. Things really started to change when it hit the pocketbook. And people got the realization that uh, we can't continue doing this. We gotta change our ways. After the court's decision, WLBT needed both interim operators and long-term African-American managers to ensure the station's ongoing health. A guy named Doug O'Connor, who was a field secretary for United Church of Christ, and was a native Bostonian whom I knew, called me and asked me, would you be interested in being the first black general manager in the country? And I said, of course I'd be interested in it. And he said, there's only one catch. It's in Mississippi. And I said, goodbye, Doug, and hung up on him. When I got here, I realized there were actually two stations, one black, one white. And as I got to moving around and seeing things, I re realized that an experienced white operator here would look at a young black operator and see they're going to make a mistake and let them make it rather than stopping it. And to me, that was just hurting the station as a whole. It wasn't hurting the black operator. It wasn't hurting the white operator. It was hurting the station. So one of my first things was to try to get all the workers to work together. And I guess being somewhat of a, a taskmaster, I think they united behind disliking me. <laughs> There's no station in this country that can come close to the things that we've done and continue to do. 
and I can say that without any reservations whatsoever. We're the first station in the South and maybe in the country to have a black male anchor and a white female anchor on together. I'd say our greatest achievement has been our unrelenting and non-negotiable service to the community. And now, Frank Melton with The Bottom Line. Not one dime in additional taxes until this city and this county get their act together. At the same time, OC Inc. was at work on similar challenges in cities across the country. Texarkana constituted a television market that was physically and racially divided between two states, Texas and Arkansas. Some local citizens saw the economic disparities brought on by race and how biased television programming reinforced social inequities. We were looking for ways to make businesses and government more responsive to the community, in particular the minority community. So we were immediately interested in something that might change the television coverage that we had in Texarkana. Because the United Church of Christ had on staff uh, an individual who was capable of analyzing uh, broadcast logs, we had facts with which to speak to management about. It became apparent, I think, to KTAL-TV management that they needed to do something that this was, this was a situation escalating beyond their immediate opportunities to control it. So they asked to have meetings with us. The agreement that we reached with them, an agreement that was prepared with the assistance of the UCC Office of Communication, was one, A, that legally could stand it was not an agreement that was simply cobbled together. B, it was an agreement that required that we get to know each other. It turned out that that was one of the most important things that happened because suddenly for management, we were not a vague, threatening group which would pull the rug out from under their broadcasting program, but we were people who had some standing in all of the communities we represented. If broadcasters must be responsible to all segments of the community, then clearly hiring practices at all levels should reflect the community served. Simple? Not quite. After we won the WLBT case and had standing, the first thing we did was to petition the, the FCC to issue equal employment opportunity rules. And we filed that petition in 69 and fought it for two years and they passed them. Those rules would not have been in effect for 30 years but for the consistent support and strong moral leadership of the Office of Communication. In Youngstown, Ohio, one woman who had her own TV show saw the need for training to equip black youth for substantive jobs in the telecommunications industry. She contacted OC Inc. and together the United Church of Christ and Margaret Linton Lanier took on a system that was entrenched and unresponsive. Black Broadcasting Coalition was born out of that desire to train black people to perform efficiently and get paid. Jim Mosley uh, contacted Reverend Parker and let me tell you, that's when the action started. They sent um, PhDs from New York to Youngstown, put them up in a hotel for weeks in order for them to consult with us and find out what we wanted and help us write the proposals, and they stayed until the job was done. One of our demands were training of minorities on the college level in broadcast skills in coordination with Youngstown State University, which was paid for by the broadcast licensees. A part of our proposal, each licensee would hire throughout the broadcast industry on every level minorities, and that's what they did. As you know, the UCC has had a long partnership with the Commission in the quest for equal employment opportunity. For us, at its heart, it's a question of justice. After addressing equal employment opportunity rules, OC Inc. continued its prophetic voice as emerging technologies prompted new challenges to diversity in the marketplace of ideas. OC Inc. fought off challenges to the Fairness Doctrine. During the early years of cable TV, OC Inc. organized meetings and advised communities on securing public access on and franchise negotiations with cable operators. It helped defend the equal time rule for political candidates, 
establish minimums for children's programming, and develop a program rating system. After the breakup of the Bells, OC Inc. helped create a consumer coalition to educate people about how to make the most of the services available to them. For a major religious organization to set out a social justice agenda around uh, broadcasting media reform, I think it was and is highly unusual. I think in one level it has to be a reflection of a commitment of an individual and their understanding of the power of the media in this country and the, the role that it can play in shaping everyone's lives. The United Church of Christ Office of Communication uh, was charged with doing a ministry in mass communications. It seemed perfectly logical that an obvious extension of that ministry would be to assure that the mass media serves people from all backgrounds and pay special need to those who are less well off, not just in terms of their uh, financial resources, but also in terms of their information resources. So it's a very logical extension of the basic principles that the United Church of Christ has always functioned under. How critical it is that this media reflect a broadly diverse set of perspectives and give voice to the fullest possible range of our nation's racial, cultural, philosophical, and political contexts. Everett Parker also helped promote diversity within the ranks of communications professionals through creation of the Emma L. Bowen Foundation for Minority Interests in Media. This is how I learned about the United Church of Christ's historic legacy in media advocacy. I am a proud alumni of the Emma L. Bowen Foundation, and now I serve as a mentor for our new interns at our station. The most important thing that I have done in my whole life is uh, getting the EEO rules and starting the Foundation so for Minority Interest in Media, which has put hundreds of minority kids, boys and girls, into the broadcasting and cable industries. And not only are you creating uh, people who have come in to further diversify our industry, but you're creating positive role models back in the communities. And I think there's tremendous uh, opportunity for uh, minorities in our industry today. I think that whatever barriers have existed are coming down. Most of the network companies are much more aggressive now in taking on uh, foundation students, for example, um, intern programs, uh, associate programs. There are a variety of these kinds of uh, things available. The work continues into the 21st century. OC Inc., along with a coalition of other advocacy groups, joined in the fight to establish low-power FM radio stations, a new service initiated by the FCC in January 2000, under the chairmanship of William Kennard. Many, many people around the country helped to inspire the idea of low-power FM radio. Uh, churches, community groups, uh, even some organizations that uh, were broadcasting illegally, uh, so-called pirate radio operators. Clearly there's a need out there for people who want to use the airwaves uh, for democracy, to speak to their communities, to provide um, information and, and entertainment to communities that are not being met by the commercial broadcast industry. Our changing demographics are very uh, indicative that we need a lot more uh, variety in the types of information, types of cultures, the types of values that exist in our communities. On the other hand, consolidated broadcasting looks for the most common denominator and essentially wipes out a great majority of the people and its listenership. I got involved in Low Power FM because it was an opportunity for churches, for minority groups, for small neighborhood clubs and organizations to have a voice that could be heard in a very small area. And it seemed to me that it was not only a good thing to happen as far as information is concerned, but give minorities an opportunity to be heard. And so I thought it was a wonderful idea. Anytime in, in this country you can take a natural resource like FM radio and you can make it available to the community, it creates community good. 
it gives a new platform for free expression. It, it allows schools to do a better job of communicating with the families they serve. It allows college students an opportunity to take this independent music or alternative content that people don't simply have a chance to experience and get it out to the community at large. And that's why I think this grassroots movement around low power FM is so exciting. It represents a real departure from the traditional uh, effort to sort of buy your way into media ownership. And it's a chance to let a thousand flowers bloom. The emergence of digital technology, the consolidation of media ownership, the weakening of cross-ownership rules, and EEO guidelines, OC Inc. has a vital role to play in our nation's future as we continue to promote diversity, make information accessible to all, and give voice to the voiceless. As we move into the digital age, and Americans have access to more and more uh, ways of getting news and information and entertainment and public affairs, it's very important that those fundamental principles um, translate into some of these new media. The most important, still unanswered question in the digital age is what responsibilities will the broadcasters have to discharge towards children, minorities, and others in our society in return for the digital spectrum which they have received. And that is why the church and everyone who cares about uh, democratization of access to information uh, is participating uh, in an aggressive way in this debate. You can have a thousand outlets, but if the inputs are only from two or three companies, then you don't have a diversity of ideas, you don't have a diversity of information. It is documented. There is less and less minority-owned telecommunications, uh, radios, television stations, uh, than there have been in the past due to these mergers and consolidations. I don't think that's what America is supposed to be all about. OC Inc. The vision of Everett Parker and the commitment of the United Church of Christ has changed the way America sees itself. It is a proud and restless history, still not content, pressing on toward the future. I'm Rakia Smith. Thank you for watching. The United Church of Christ has set the example of fairness. I think it's doing a, a terrific service, uh, not only for the, directly for the people who are involved, but for the entire country. The one solid, faithful, always there contender for the public interest. In Washington, it's a brand name, and it stands for racial justice.